Hey, Pat, how you doing? It's been good so far. Getting even better today. <laughs> oh, you know what I just realized too with that little glitch? Forgot to get the camera on. Of course, you're going to see me with my glasses today. My eyes, um, having some issues with my eyes, and I tried to put my contacts in this morning because there's always a glare on my glasses, so it kind of irritates me, but um, it just bugging my eyes too much, so I couldn't, I couldn't do it, so I had to take them out. But hey, Robert. Hello, Helen. Choppy. I don't know what you're watching. I'm not seeing any chop. I'm seeing a free fall. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> that's the point, is to make it look like I'm smart. <laughs> I usually only wear glasses around the house. I've got two or three different pair kind of laying around just give my eyes a break from the contacts but let me get the disclaimer out of the way and uh basically says we don't i'm not a registered broker or investment advisor i will not give you any recommendations or advice everything we do here is purely for educational purposes so if we do talk about a trade just assume that it is a paper trade or a practice trade for regulatory reasons we do not discuss funded trading yeah yeah it's going down big time so uh, there are pockets of stuff. I mean, gold is, is rallying big time, which makes me cranky because I got out of a, a, a call position on some on NEM last week or earlier. I think it was earlier this week, actually. And I'm kicking myself. I wish I'd have held on longer, but I still made a profit, but nowhere near as big as it could have been. So, but I found another one that was good. So, so let's talk about what we're going to, uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, unfortunately, I know I usually start off with the, um, the upcoming events. And unfortunately I did not get that for whatever reason, either I missed it or I don't know what happened, but I'm going to, um, you know what? I just realized I could solve that real quick and easy. Actually, I think let's do this. We'll just go to the website and use it as a guide. Where is today? We are on the fourth. So trading coaches playbook, you can see right here is the, there's the, um, what we're doing right now, right? Noon Eastern time. And then at 2 PM, I will be uh, doing my patterns in a flash class for those that are subscribers to patterns in a flash. If you're not shame, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you can go get that of course is, uh, and there's always a two week free trial. So if you want to join me today at uh, two o'clock Eastern time, just a couple hours, hour or two after we're done here, then uh, go take the trial on that and come join me in there. And then if you kick the tires around and see if you like the tool itself, and if you do, then keep it. If you don't, then no big deal. No harm, no foul. So, and then right after this class, I got to finish right at 9.55 today. Um, I don't know how many of you ever watched Benzinga, but uh, I'm on there every couple of weeks or so for about 30 minutes. So right after we're done here, I will be on uh, Benzinga with Spencer and possibly Aaron. So uh, you can come check that out. You can go, it streams on YouTube. So if you want to do that, uh, come out and have some fun there. So is that a question, Darlo? Every other, we do the, the live class every two weeks, if that's what you're asking. I'm not sure if that's what you were asking about, but yeah, every, every two weeks we do the, the live class for patterns or flash subscribers. So, okay. So anybody else here struggle with this thing called patience? Or is it just me? Am I alone here? And I'm trying really hard not to be cranky about it because I pulled the trigger on a day trade this morning and then pulled the trigger and got out. And if I would have waited just one or two more minutes, uh, I mean, it stopped me out. It went a little bit further than expected, but had I held on for just a minute or two and been patient. <laughs> and I realized how fitting this is. So I took a, I, uh, I took a loss on a little loss. And right now I'd be up about 500 if I would have just held on. So, and just since the open. So I get a little, a little cranky sometimes when I don't, I don't even do what I'm teaching. Right. But at the same time, it hit my stop and it went beyond it. So on one hand, I'm cranky that I didn't wait for a couple of minutes to see if it would turn around. But on the other hand, I followed my plan. So it's always, a, it's almost always a catch 22. If you follow your plan, that's a good thing. But then it's still frustrating that if you would have waited a little bit, you'd have been not only fine, but awesome. So it's, it's always that. So um, 
Hey, Brenda. <laughs> yeah, I see some emphatics. Yes, yes, I do. Um, and it is hard, right? Especially when things are moving, especially when they're moving fast, like this morning. I mean, if you're looking to get on the puts, it's I'm kicking myself for not jumping on Microsoft sooner. And then it took off and I'm like, okay, just let it be. It's, it's probably going to keep going. So <laughs> yeah, I, I knew Robert, I'm not alone because this is, this is a challenge. I think the challenges that I've had with trading, everybody struggles with. It's not a, it's, it's not a, you know, individualistic thing. So if you're, if you're having a challenge with something with regard to trading, whether it's patience or anything at all, the greedy, somebody put greedy and patient. Yeah. Um, you're normal. Okay. We're all, as far as I'm concerned, God gave us all the same emotions at the core. They all are there. It's a question of how we respond to them is, is how we deal with it. Right. So Yeah, that's the thing, Blade. That's the hard part. You say, <laughs> and that's exactly what I, that's why I pulled the trigger this morning. So when I wait, you wait a little bit, it keeps going against you. And that's the tricky part. You never know when it's going to turn back the other way or if it's going to continue going. And even though I'm frustrated with this morning, at the same time, I'm not because it wasn't a massive hit. It wasn't that big of a deal. Overall, it's not a, a big amount of money. Um, it was more than I actually had planned on, but at the same time, I didn't know if it was going to stop. It could have just kept falling. And that's the hard part, right? It's always 50-50. You get out, and I literally was the, the, I was the low of the, that candle, and then it turned around and took off to the upside. Not the low of the day, but the low of the candle, and it took off and ran to the upside. And it's frustrating. But I've been in that situation, too, where I've held on, and it kept on falling. So that's the tricky part. <laughs> so don't feel bad if you're sitting there going, well, what if it keeps? I, I, I've been there, too. So, and that's where following the plan is important. So, hey, Gills. What are you talking about, Jennifer? Can't get all the money. <laughs> I know. That's what we want, though, right? We want to catch the low and sell at the high. But the market's going to do its own thing at its own time. So we have zero control over it. And that's one of the things that I know is difficult for me. And I think it's fairly normal is that we all want to have total control over it. We wish that we could... You know, if we cheer it on, then it's going to keep going in our favor, right? If we yell for it, you know, if we act like a cheerleader on the sidelines, but that's the thing. You're just a cheerleader on the sidelines. You're not on the field. You're not in the game. You have no control over the results of the game. You're just standing watching. You're, you're a third-party observer, if you will. So, but it is sometimes difficult to let the trade come to you, right? You want to jump in when it's moving. So that's what we want, right? I'm getting to let have myself. The ultimate goal is to have your account grow like when we're in a bull market, right? And if you were, if you got massively bullish last year in 2020, when things hit the bottom and you jumped in and rode that wave, then your account looked like the market did, right? Question is, what's it looking like now? And the beautiful thing is if you trade both sides and you know how to trade the downside, then your account should still be in bull mode, right? So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of people that are, accounts have turned bearish even. And that's where learning to flip, you know, flipping the script and flipping it over and going, okay, now instead of buying the dips, now we're going to sell the rallies. Each time it rallies, we're looking to sell. Just like last year, right? If you were, if you were buying the dips last year, when, when we're in a bull market, the market rallies up, right? You sell off, take your profit, it pulls back some, and then you go, okay, when's it, when's it done pulling back? And then you start to buy. And in the bull market, you, it runs up and you obviously do well then, right? And that works great in a bull market. That's what everybody was doing. Everybody was an expert. Now, all those people that were experts last year, all the people in the water cooler at work that were telling you how much money they were making in the market, ask them how they're doing now. I'll bet you $1,000 a piece that none of them are even talking about the market right now. They won't tell you. The people that last year were telling you how much money they were making trading, they're not talking now, are they? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Sorry, I haven't had enough coffee yet today. Um, so now instead of buying the dips, now we got to shift our mindset to sell the rallies because we are, I don't know if we're officially in bear territory or not. We're having a big short covering rally right now, but um, we're definitely on the downswing. So 
That's this was this was not what you want your account to look like. If you got bullish in 2020 when it bottomed out, then right here in the middle of the chart is what it looked like. It rallied up. And if you didn't get out of the bullish stuff, then you probably crashed it here in the last couple of months. This is what we want our account to look like, right? You rally up, rally up. Maybe, maybe this is a little drawdown that we've had in the last month or two. Maybe you haven't seen yet to switch it over. But the goal now, now if we know we're in bear mode and we're going to sell the rallies, then this is what your account should look like over the next couple of years, right? <clears throat> Well, yeah, and that, <laughs> it's a good point, Pat. And the funny thing is, is a lot of a lot of tech stocks, the smaller guys, the overall market has stayed bullish. But most of the tech stocks, I mean, go look what we were looking at last night in, in Trade U. It was um, what was that one we were looking at? I mean, you can look. There's PayPal. There's um, oh, Roku. Roku hit four seventy five, and it's now at one hundred twenty five. It's off seventy five percent. Seventy five percent. And one of the things to be aware of, if you weren't there last night at Trade U, um, there is, and I can't remember all the, the data, there's, there's so many different data points right now that are pointing to a bear, not only a bear market, but probably a crash and possibly a massive crash. And one of them was, and I saw it a couple of weeks ago, and I've seen it before, but the gentleman that was talking about it, he's been around for 40 years, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but the gist of it is, I think he said it was over 40% of NASDAQ stocks or maybe overall stocks of the overall market had dropped at least 50% in the last year. Even though the market's making new highs, you've got a huge percentage of the stocks on the overall market are already in bear mode. Not only in bear mode, but they have lost 50% or more of their valuation, right? Both, Darlo, Roku and the, well, Roku is an example of what the overall market is, because a lot of them, again, you go look at PayPal and Square and um, Peloton, um, what, well, Etsy, what are some of the other, Pinterest, a lot of those things have all dropped well over 50% already, but the market was only off 10 or 15%, right? So you've got this massive slew of stocks that aren't, they're not the big high flyers. They don't move the market because they're not a big, a big enough portion of the market, right? You got the Apples and the Microsofts and the Amazons and Facebooks of the world that there's such a huge percentage of the overall market that they have stayed higher because they're the big blue chips, right? So it, it looks like the overall market is doing okay, but in reality, there's this huge slew of stocks that are getting hammered. So, and again, I can't remember exactly what the data point this guy was saying, but was, I think it was like 40% of overall stocks were off more than 50%, even though the overall market was still in bull mode. And he said, there's only two times that this has happened in history. Once was in 1929, the other one was in 2000. And there's lots of stats like that that other people have come out with. Um, there was, what was the one I saw? I took a picture of that. It was very similar type of information. So there's only three times it's happened in history it was a similar concept as far as um, a big percentage of stocks that were down. And anyway, basically, he said it happened only three times in history, and all three times were in December of 99. You know what happened in 2000, right? So again, I'm not trying to freak anybody out. But at the same time, you got to trade the market for what it is. You can't, you know, a lot of people trade on hopes and dreams, and I hope it goes back up. I bought this stock, and I bought it at 150, and now it's at 40. You can hope it goes back up, but it's at this point, it's not likely. So, um, so yes. <laughs> so in other words, um, that's the, the larger point that I'm saying is that we are officially making lower highs and lower lows. And if we, if we, when we go look at charts, we'll go do that here. I'll show you on the S and P exactly why I'm bearish. Um, and the, and the Dow. Well, everything really, but um, uh, companies like Amazon, Netflix, or companies invest in times of inflation. Um, I think I, if I understand your question right, Pat, are you saying that you know, Netflix and Amazon are good companies to, to own during inflationary periods? Um, 
as far as Amazon goes, that's tricky because they're in so, excuse me, they're in so many different industries. The retail side of Amazon, I'd say absolutely not. Um, retail itself is definitely going to take a hit. It already is taking a hit because when you're spending, you know, 50% or 75% or, or double the amount of money to put fuel in your car, you don't have as much money to, to go to Nordstrom or Macy's, right? Or shop on Amazon. So when your basic living expenses are taking a bigger chunk of your, your, your cash flow every month, you have less discretionary to spend. So they're not going to, you're not going to spend as much at Amazon. I mean, the whole retail sector, I think in the next one to three years is going to get absolutely hammered. Um, because I, I have very little doubt that there, there's so many, there's so many different indicators that this market is super top heavy. And there's so many different things. You've got the stock markets at highs. Real estate is crazy insane, um, at least especially in the Seattle area. It's absolutely nuts. There's a house in Bellevue that listed for 1.6 and it sold for 2.4 million. Eight, a 50% premium, um, which is insanity. It's, it is. It's absolutely nuts. Um, you know, and what do you do with that? You know, and they're cash buyers. And they're people that come in that they have cash. And they just... In, it's crazy. I think it's totally nuts, but uh, that's what's been happening out here. A lot of people coming in for Amazon. Bell in Bellevue is crazy. Year over year, east of Bellevue, year over year, real estate doubled. When was the last time you ever saw real estate double? Real estate is like the slow way to invest, right? Not not around here. Um, it was a nice house. I mean, I saw pictures of it, and that's why it went for so much because it was it was a, a good sized chunk of land and in Bellevue and Amazon's moving over to Bellevue, right? They've got their second campus they're building over there. That's why that part has gone so crazy because there's massive demand and not not much supply. And the, from the pictures of this house, it was it was gorgeous, 3,500 square feet, had like a three car garage, beautifully manicured. It was just it was perfect. So which makes sense why it would go for so much. But anyway, there's just this perfect storm of of craziness happening, right? You got retail traders in 2020 came crazy into it, which is usually a sign there's the end. You got the AMC, um, what's the other one? GameStop, um, car was one example. When you see those types of things happening, that's usually a clue that the, the end is near. And we're seeing now in the charts and the activity of the market that the end is near. I mean, we're, we're at the end as far as I'm concerned. So um, yeah, gold, gold's been going crazy the last few weeks. Um, I was kind of surprised it took uh, it took so long for him to to get going, but but you had to stick a knife in that wound, huh, Jennifer? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm cranking. I got out of NEM. I, I was in NEM at about 62, and now it's at 73. And I actually went longer term out of the money. I paid like two bucks. I got in a couple. I was about 210 on the options, and they're selling for six bucks right now. So I got out too early. I mean, I still had a profit, but. You know, when you get out, I think I got out average of like three and a half or something. So, you know, I was still around 60 or 70% rate of return. But if you would have gotten a triple, it's, it, it'll make you cranky. I don't care who you are. I've been at this for almost 22 years now and I still get cranky. <laughs> it's like, ah, frustrating. But it's all right. It's all right. So uh, commodities with inflation, yes. Typically commodities do well in inflationary periods. That's why Alcoa is at 88 bucks. Talk about frustrating. That's one we talked about last night too. We, I bought that, the stock. I sold puts on it and got put to it back when it was five bucks in my kids' accounts too, which was frustrating because I threw, I'm trying to get my kids interested, right? They're 11 and 15. They were what, not 10 and, 10 and 14 at the time. It was last, last year or 2020, I threw just a thousand bucks in there, hoping they would help me trade it and, and they would actually get interested. Um, they're not yet, but I bought Alcoa in there for, Four and a half bucks, I think our cost basis was. And that little $1,000, if I'd have just held it till now, it'd be worth eight grand right now. But woulda, shoulda, coulda. I think it sold at like eight or 10 bucks. We made more than double. But uh, anyway, now I'm getting off track here. So yeah, commodities typically do well in inflationary periods, typically. Don't know if this is going to be a typical year or not, but we'll see. <laughs> buyers. Is that a typo or is that a new term that I haven't heard?
Yeah, exactly, Pat. Yeah, commodities, especially gold, do well in inflationary periods. So. so let me get back to the script, Brenda. Let me, Gabby. <laughs> I agree. If you guys give me squirrels, though, those of you who know me, I'm a little ADD, so you'll I'll, I'll definitely find some squirrels if you give them to me. Don't overtrade. And that is another one that is uh, that is also tough to do, right? Because especially when things are moving faster, there are a lot. And I get caught. I catch myself, especially with day trades. I'm not that patient and I want to, you know, you get in and out in a bunch. And so, but one of the things important is to be patient with yourself. Okay. If you're new to trading, if you haven't been trading for a long time, um, it's challenging. That, that's a nice way of putting it. I have said a lot that trading is one of the most difficult things you'll ever do in life. It is a very difficult thing to do because even though you may know everything there is to know about the market, but managing your emotions and keeping them in check is difficult and challenging, right? So not panicking out of stuff and um, sticking to your plan, being disciplined. There's a lot of different things that a lot of skills you have to develop that a lot of us don't necessarily get from other areas of life as kids. I mean, I learned some things, but there's other skills that are necessary for trading that I didn't grow up with. So it's, uh, whoops. Just don't beat yourself up. Okay. You're going to have, you're going to have tough days. You're going to have tough weeks. You're going to have tough months. It's if you've been married before, you know, all right. There's, I've heard a lot of people say that have been married for 50 years. You know, you have good days, you have bad days, you have good weeks and bad weeks, good months, and bad years, even right. It's trading is similar, right? It's, it's just challenging. It's very, very challenging to keep your emotions in check. So uh, yeah. See Evelyn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she says my, my emotions are the hardest part and they are, and it's difficult. So that's one of the reasons last night at Trade You, for those of you that were there, I talked about scaling because scaling is a, a tool that you can put in your tool belt, something you can utilize that will uh, help to manage your emotions. Of course, it might rub your emotions raw a little bit too, because when you look at, well, where's it at now? Oh, it's not that. Okay, good. Things have popped back up a little bit. I just, I scaled into Apple a little bit this morning. I bought just a couple of contracts on it and was expecting to add to it, was thinking it would pop back up, but it just started tanking. So <laughs> I'm sitting there going, I wish I would have, I wish I would have bought more, but I didn't. So, but it's okay. If it keeps going in my favor, then I'll keep making money. And if I, if it, if it doesn't, then no big deal. It doesn't cost me that much if it, things turn around. Yes. Perfect timing. I will, um, let me bring that up right now here. I think I'm pretty sure that was the end. Yep. Whoops. So let's see if there's anything that we can. There's AEM. There's what gold's doing right there, that upper left chart. Uh, Microsoft. That's a little bit tempting, but it's not, it's not a clean enough pattern now. Alcoa is, I'm going to make this up because we might just play with this a little bit. Y'all going to be offended if I, I'm going to show you scaling right now, live and in person. Oops. Um, where, oh, oh, this is a, there it is. Okay. I'm just going to short, say, 100 shares of Alcoa at, if it breaks, let's go 87, 8, 98. Just below 88. If it breaks 88, then I'll, let's just say it. Again, I'm just showing this for an example, right? I always check the market first. PX. Is that supposed to be SPX? I already know what the market's doing. And Alcoa is going against the market. The market's getting hammered, isn't it? I mean, it's the SPX is off 45 and Alcoa is up four bucks, five bucks, five and a half bucks. But we have kind of a double top going on here. This is, I mean, from a pattern perspective, is there's a, the formation of a double top. Let me zoom this in a little bit bigger. 
And then we have a shooting star, right? We had a little shooting star here. And again, this is a five minute chart. And this is one, I mean, waiting for this thing to see. And basically I'm looking at, we got a shooting star. We've got this other candle right here. And if it breaks below this low, then I'll pick up just a little position. And then I'm going to add, how far do you go? We'll go right below, actually I'll go below that. We'll go below the close of that candle, 87.76. I'm going to throw another order out here for 87.76. Now, here's the thing that's challenging and is right now it's ticking up, right? How many of you are sitting there going, you should buy, buy the stock, buy the stock. And again, I'm just doing the stock because I'm not going to mess with options for a day trade if it's a short-term thing. And I'm looking to do that right now just while we're here, hopefully. So that dash line would be my stop. If this thing, if it comes down and triggers my entry here at 88, that'll be my stop. And if it, it stops me out for 100 shares, what's that, 88.59? So I've got about 60 or 70 bucks on the line. That's it. That's not a lot, right? If it's just 100 shares. If it continues to fall, if it turns over, it does what it did back here at 88 and it takes drops to, to 85. I mean, that's a three-point move. Then it'll pick up another 100 shares here at 87.76, which at that point, what's this at 96? I'm already up 20 bucks on this other 100. And then I'll actually put another one. I don't know if this thing's really going to tank that much. 87.42. I'll throw another one here at 87.42, which is breaking the lows. So if this thing turns over and drops off, especially if, even if it drops down here, this 86.37, and then I would just put a trailer on it and trail, I'll put a trailer on each of these 100 share positions. If it hits 88, I'll put the stop up here. If it comes down and hits the next one, Then I would move the stop, the first 100 share stop down to here and then put another stop up there. So does that kind of make sense? Over trading. <laughs> I'm scaling, Brenda, scaling. And actually it would blow your mind how effective this is. Because the thing is, if it comes down and hits me, if it comes down and hits the 88 point and then it turns around and rallies, since obviously the momentum is to the upside, so I'm trading this counter trend. So I do want to be in and out of it as quickly as possible. And really what I'm hoping for is a big move like this, which probably won't happen, but at the same time, I'll scale into it piece by piece. And by the time it gets to this last entry point at 87.40, my stop on the initial position will be here at 88. So even if it comes down and hits and I get all 300 shares of it, I'm going to get out of 100 shares of it there at... Um, at a break even at least. So we'll see, but, <laughs> but yeah, I would, I, I wouldn't, and again, this is just on the stock, right? It's not an option trade. If I was trading options, it'd be a different, and mo for the most part, I only swing trade options. I don't day trade them. I've done it a little bit, but if the situation's right, I'll, I'll day trade some options, but it's gotta be a longer, a longer move. So something we're looking for a little bit, a little bit more, but We will keep an eye on that. If y'all have something you want to look at, a particular stock, I'm going to actually shrink this down and put it over here on the other screen and bring this up. But if y'all have stocks you want to look at, just let me know, throw out a ticker symbol. Actually, I need to get rid of those two. Um, Okay, awesome. I see some tickers. Yes, Pat, try it. <laughs> Just do it. It is, um, and I appreciate the the the, the humility. Um, not sure why it's made by experience, but scaling in scares me. Um, it is mind boggling how how much emotional control it really gives you. Because again, I'll bring this back over here and then we'll go look at your chart. See, right now I'm looking at it going, okay, if it doesn't break down and create a double top, then I'm not going to do it. But again, if I, if it comes down and hits 88, which it very well could do, right? Because we have 88 is a resistance level right here. So if it comes and hits this, this is part of the, mind, the, the, the process that I'm thinking of is we're already in a bullish trend. And if it continues, I don't want to be there. But if it does form a double top, I'd like to take advantage of it. But that's also going to be a support level. Could be a support level, I should say. 
So if I get triggered here, I don't want to have a lot of risk. So I just do a little bit. But if it does continue to fall, again, I get here. Now, if it triggers this one, that means it's fallen even more. And I'm already up a little bit. So now I move my stop on the, it'd be half of it. So I don't care anymore at this point. Once it hits 87.77, I'm profitable. So I'm good either way. So even if it turns around and stops me out of both of them, I'm still perfectly fine. That makes sense? It's, it's kind of hard to describe and hard to explain. And that's why I say, just do it. I'm just going to get rid of these orders because it's not going. So now it's, now it's at a point, it's moved high enough where the double top is kind of negated as of right now. So, but yeah, it is. And I totally get it because it was it challenging for me to, to overcome that mindset of, I don't want to pay more for it than I, than I did already. So, but yeah, I get it, but try it and see and watch, watch what it does to your emotional state. That's frustrating right there. AEM. Because this was my day trade at 53.50 and I got stopped out right down in here. Yeah, I'd be up, I'd be up a buck and a quarter on. I, 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 only, I only started it with 500 shares and got stopped out. So I probably would have added to this and had a thousand. I'd probably be up a thousand or 1200 bucks on AEM right now, but woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? And now I'm looking at it and it's easy to, to want to chase it. But, and I almost got back in here and then I went, nah, I decided to hold off and I'm kicking myself for not jumping back in, but I was trying to be patient. <laughs> and now I'm frustrated because I was being patient. All right, let's go. We got some tickers. Um, oh, the spider. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up. So the spiders in the queues are going to mimic the overall markets. So I'm going to bring up just the overall markets and show you. This is another reason that excuse me, I'm bearish on the overall market. So here's the SPX, right? Which is going to look just like the spiders. So who is it? Oh, Brenda, yeah. Um, you can see there's a head and shoulders there, right? It's pretty obvious. And that trend that we've had since 2020, since the COVID crash has been busted. It busted it back here in January. So I'm actually going to delete that. But we have a pretty nice, pretty solid head and shoulders. Now, you want to see something a little bit crazy. Is there, so this is right now, right? Those of you who were here last night saw this. What's this right here? You all see that? You see that head and shoulders? That's 2008. That is 2008. There's the 2008 crash. We went from 1,500 to 700. <laughs> now you know why. For those of you that are like, oh, why is he so bearish? That's why right there. Because that's exactly what showed up in 2008. Gave us a clue. Gave us a technical indication that the market is probably going to drop. Now, do we know with certainty? Absolutely not. We never know with certainty. But that was 2008. There is today. And the Dow looks exactly the same or very similar. Another head and shoulders. We've broken it. We came up, kissed the neckline. And the long-term picture, there's the long-term trend, which that's about right. But realistically, we're looking at, I mean, if it takes a year to get there, this is obviously going to continue to slope up, right? So we're going to be about 27.5. I think, I think about 30,000 on the Dow is probably realistic, if not 25. So it'll be interesting to see, that's for certain. This is one of the reasons that I'm, you know, I've shifted from, um, and I actually started last year from buy the dip to sell the rally. I started a little too early. So the last few months of last year, I just kind of treaded water. I didn't do that spectacular. I kept getting stopped out because I was expecting it to drop and crash. And this year, the first two months of this year has been spectacular. Because it finally did what it's supposed to do. <laughs> so you got to not say that because the market does what it does. It's not what, not what you want it to. <clears throat> yeah, 
I, I would expect Brandon to, too. I've, I watch this stuff once in a while when I have time. So, um, <clears throat> so what makes the pattern, what negates the pattern, basically? If it breaks back above the neckline. So let me go. This is just a Dow. If it either breaks back above the neckline, which the beautiful thing here is we not only have the neckline there, which has got a nice, just a, a little bit of a slope. If it's too slope, then... But then we also have this, this horizontal support just shy of 34, which has come into play quite a bit, and it is breaking below that. So as long as it stays below this, this 34, basically 34,000, anything below 34,000, I'd be bearish on. And you can see we've got lower highs, lower lows. We've broken the new lows. We, I think we're, I'm, you know what? I should have updated this. Let's update this right now, actually, so we can get today's. Lost my charts over there. Oop. Yeah, there's see. Whoa, what's going on here? I thought I got rid of that Alcoa stock. Whew, good thing that didn't hit. I just noticed. See, should have bought calls on Alcoa. Yeah, it is what it is. But look at the tech. I mean, there's Microsoft. Close that off. Microsoft rolling back over. I mean, we're going to have a short cover rally, no doubt. This thing sold off so much. Um, that's crazy. Alcoa is just going crazy to the upside which is fine, I'm not in it, so I don't care. I wish I was in it right now, but at the same time, I'm not worried. Um, market that has patience. <laughs> yes, I like the spelling of patience you're using because that's what a lot of people are gonna feel like is being patience. I'm assuming that's what you're meaning, right? <laughs> like patience in the hospital. So yeah, but you can see, I mean, there's the there's the S and the SPX is the same thing, right? We're looking at, did we get updated yet? Down 49, uh, 3, 4. Yeah, 923. So that's about that's about 15, 20 minutes behind. But there's today's candle. And we've had a little rally here in the last, I don't know, half hour or so, which again is to be expected. Unless I don't know if there's some kind of news, but So there's, you can see, and Brenda, this is for you. There's the SPYs. You can see it's exactly the same. Looks identical to the SPX. And Qs, Qs are going to be a little different. Whoops, QQC. The NASDAQ doesn't have the head and shoulders um, that the SPX and the Dow have. It's got a nice double top up here. But this is even more, it looks even more bearish. You can see the, 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 the drop in the NASDAQ, which because they're tech heavy, they do move a lot faster. But... Uh, it dropped big and you can see lower highs, lower lows for certain. So the question becomes how low will this possibly go? I'm gonna get rid of this too. I don't have the longer term picture on here. So there's the longer term trend on the NASDAQ. That's it essentially. Just a little bit there. Yeah, so about, I mean, this is the Qs, but yeah, about 200. So this thing's got a long ways to fall. It could, it could very easily get all the way back to there. And realistically, you can see, and this is the beauty of it. You can see, here's the little crash. Right? Here's a little mini crash in 15, right? But we start that trend right here. We've got three hits on it. And in 18, the market drops off pretty heavy. And where does it dig in? Right there at that trend line we established. And then the COVID crash, where did it dig in and bounce? Right at that trend line. So it recognizes this trend line. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it, you know, wherever this is, it'll probably be about 225. In fact, I'm going to take this and move it down. I would imagine it'll probably be right around there over the next year or so. It'll climb up there a little bit. Yes, Pat. And this is one thing that came up a couple of weeks ago and. People call it the death cross. Some article that the NASDAQ has done the death cross. When the 50-day crosses below the 200-day moving average, that is a signal for a lot of the big hedge funds and the big money managers that we've turned bearish and it's time to start selling things. So that is, uh, oh, that's on the queues, which NASDAQ, that's what it was. NASDAQ happened a couple weeks ago. The Dow, I think, yeah, it's about to do that. It hasn't done it yet. Russell did it a long time ago. 
The SPX, it hasn't yet done it. And here's another thing too, just a, a big picture perspective is the Russell, if you're not familiar with the Russell, this is the, the 2000 small caps, right? So these are the little companies. These are not the Microsofts and the Amazons that are the, the aircraft carriers out in the middle of the ocean. When a storm comes, they can weather it because they're big enough, right? The little guys, the little guy in the fishing boat, he's running for sure because he doesn't have billions of dollars in the bank to withstand the storm. So he's getting the heck out of Dodge. These are the little companies. The SPX, the Dow, and the NASDAQ all were running higher last year, right? And look at the Russell, what it did all year. Just went sideways. And this, to me, was the first big clue. And this is why I started to get bearish towards the middle of last year in March, April, May, seeing the Russell going sideways like this and not breaking out when everything else was making new highs. Like, yeah, that's kind of a clue that things are shaping up to get bearish. And it took a while. But they're there, and you can see when it cracked that 2130 level, we're now in a new range, and we're likely headed to about 1750 on this thing. So, now, when you say you wonder if they consider options, are you talking about you know charting options, or are you talking about if hedge funds and the big boys are using options? Yeah, so did I. <laughs> the fake out, yeah. Hedge funds, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Blade call support. Um, the easiest thing, if you just hit E on your screen, I, it, this will maybe be a quick little help. You hit the letter E for edit, it'll bring up this dialog box. And then you'll have your moving averages in here and you can check them or uncheck them. And you can, there's a bunch of things in here. You can edit them and change the names and all that stuff. So call, call support if you need help with that. That's what I would do. But if you hit the letter E, you'll have this and um, maybe you'll be able to figure it out. But if not, just call support. So, but yeah, hedge funds use, use um, oh, that was loud. Hedge funds use options too, all the time. Uh, and they've gotten more and more popular. I can't remember. I, I saw, I think it was John Nigerian was, uh, He's a big options guy. And uh, he was on somewhere a couple of weeks ago or last week talking about the volume, just the sheer volume of the amount of options that trade now was something like 44 million, 44 million contracts a day trade now of options. And back in the old days, um, it was I mean, when he started 25, 20 or 25 years ago, doing a lot of options stuff, it was only like 400,000 a day or something like that. It's just that the amount of options that have traded and have become huge. So, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, options have gotten really popular. Let me just sec checking to see if we're still doing Benzinga. He usually sends the link by now, but. Um, yeah, options have just blown up and, and they're, they, they use them for hedging. They, they may use them for different stuff, but, um, I mean, they, they may or may not trade them the way that we do. So it's, and honestly, I could care less how they trade. So that's all cool. Let's see. Uh, let's go see if we have anything that we can maybe, we only got about 10 or 12 minutes left. So if you have any other tickers you want me to look at and we'll analyze them and see what things look like, then. Let me know. Um, so we've had a retracement in a lot of stocks. This is one I've been liking the last few months, Datadog. I'll go look at a daily real quick on it. So there's a daily chart. Nice double top. And the, the break of this was fun. This little, this little drop was nice and fun. And then earnings came out. It rallied up into earnings and obviously gapped up above earnings, but now looking at, uh, you know, the huge gap, it came down and filled it. It's danced around right around 150, it danced around. I'm looking at this going, you know, we're probably going to head back to this 126 level and possibly even further. I mean, there's, there's the big gap back here that hasn't been filled yet, which in this case, I mean, sometimes gaps don't fill if it just keeps on going or sometimes they do years later. But this is one where the overall market conditions being bearish. 
I wouldn't be surprised to see it fill. So short Akoa now. Let's see. Why? I'm just curious. I'm, I'm going to ask you and see. I'm going to put you to the test. Why, why short Alcoa now? Yeah, they're good, Pat. If, if you don't trade options, then definitely learn. They're not as complicated as people make them out to be. They're really not. A lot of people freak out and they're like, well, they expire. I mean, they, they could they could expire. Milk expires too. Do you not buy it because it expires? No, you just learn to use it in a timely fashion. Same thing with options. I mean, most of the stuff in your fridge expires at some point, right? You just have a plan for it and say, okay, I'm going to buy it now. Speaking of that, I got to go get milk for my kids this weekend. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, you got a week or two to use milk or it goes bad. So you just use it. Same thing with options. You buy an option that, according to your plan, here's my plan for the stock. This is what I think is going to happen. This is what I expect it to do. And it's probably going to take a couple of weeks to get from point A to point B. So I need to buy two months worth of option so it doesn't expire on me. It's that simple. It's really not, it's really not anything complicated. Um, 15 minute touch the upper band. Okay, that's a good reason. There's no right or wrong answer, Darlo. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to bust your chops here. But um, yeah, and I don't have the bands. And really what I'm looking for, especially for, well, really for any trades, whether it's a day trade or um, even a swing trade is some kind of pattern. And some kind of clue or indication that we're done, either done rallying or something else. The reason I was looking at 88, we had kind of a double top. It wasn't beautiful. It wasn't the best one I've seen, but we definitely had a double top forming. And I figured if it dropped from there, especially with that shooting star, because we had a shooting star and a double top, I figured if we dropped, we'd have a, a buck or two retracement. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I can see that definitely because this has run a bunch. And it is, uh, you're kind of tempting me to want to pull the trigger on it because. 90s around number. It's almost hit it. And uh, the steam is going to eventually die out. But at this point, with the momentum we've had, there's just no reason for me to stop to believe that this thing's going to stop right this second. But it very well could. You know, that's the hard part. You never know. So. But it's definitely tempting because things don't run forever, right? Oh, there goes AEM. Which, you know what? Here's the beauty. I don't, AEM, AEM is taken off. You can see a left-hand corner up here. Okay. And this is one that, and this is where I should have practiced patience on my own. I should have waited for it for a little bit to pull the trigger on it and either missed it or not. But I mean, I took a little bit of a hit, but I also have, uh, I, I got into call options on this too. So even though I lost some money on the day trade, I'm, uh, where am I at here? Overall, I don't even know. It's up though. I mean, I know it's up overall because I have calls on it. So that's another reason I'm not that cranky about it because if it continues to run, even though I could have made a killing on the day trade, my options trade is doing well. So I'm making up for the loss on the day trade with the options, the more it runs. So I'm not, I'm cranky about a AEM, but I'm also happy about it. Does that make sense? <laughs> so see now, Darlo, I'm going to wish I would have listened to you. What did it just hit? 96. It's going to drop $3 now, watch, just because I'm watching it. Um, let's see, what do you want to look at? New core. Yeah, I just realized we got only a few minutes, I think. Let me get that out of here. Whoops. Okay, cool. There we go. Uh, Nucor. Well, Nucor had a head and shoulders, but, and this is one reason you don't get into the head and shoulders before it breaks the neckline for that reason right there, because it didn't. And I've only got, I got to be done here in about four or five minutes. So just so you know, in fact, you know what? I'll do that. Are we on all time highs here? No, we're not. This is one reason it's important to go back and look at the entire history of the stock. Because we go back to a monthly chart, we can see that this thing's been technically as high as 300, even though, are these reverse splits, I'm guessing? Or are those actual split splits? I can't tell. 
Um, oh, wait a minute. No, those are actual splits, splits, okay. Okay, that makes sense then why it's there. Well, there's a little bit there. Whoops. Those are the next two major points as far as resistance goes. Go back to a weekly, that's not gonna show us anything. So basically, man, are these guys oil? Oh, materials and steel. Yeah, that makes sense. That's why they're doing that. Um, yeah, it's it shows it's down 53 cents, but it's probably not right now there, is it? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, it's not a tough one. It's just there's I wouldn't do anything with it right now because it's in this range. It's stuck in the middle of the range. I would expect it to come back down. If this thing drops back down to 125, then I'd be looking at a possible bullish trade. If it gives any kind of indication, it's going to hold the level, any kind of like a doji spinning top where it dances on this line for a little bit. Then I'd be interested in an upside bullish move to it. Uh, if it breaks north above 143, but the only reason I'd be hesitant with that is because look at how far it's run. I mean, it's it was 90 bucks in January 24th. I mean, five, six weeks ago, it was 90 bucks. It's now 140. That's a massive run. And while things do continue and, and, and can run, the odds of that happening are pretty slim. So from a new core perspective, if it breaks north of 143, if I was taking a bullish position, it would be a really small one. And I'd have a pretty tight stop below that level. Otherwise, I like to see it. As long as it stays anywhere in here, I wouldn't touch it. I would wait for it to come back down to 125. That would be my hope is for it to drop back off here, hold this 125 line, and then give some indication that it's going to get bullish again. And, and then I'd be jumping on a bullish side. Make sense? Um, it's a good question, Blaine. I'm, I'm, and I'm not 100% certain. I, I think I understand. So Be careful with the word requires because you can buy options for a day. I mean, yeah, typically a swing trade, you're looking at, you know, three to five days. Um, I would buy at least at least 30 days typically, uh, but you can go further out. You know, sometimes I go out of the money, like the, the NEM calls I had and actually the AEM calls that I bought, I went out of the money, but I just bought more time. I think I got four or five or six months worth of time. So if it runs to the target, then my rate of return is even bigger. If it does it quicker, if it takes more time, then that's okay. That's one reason I do that. But because um, weekly options with the appropriate days to expiration counter should monthly option chain be used. There's no, that's the hard part. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, generically speaking, just conceptually, when I'm looking for an option trade, I am looking at, first of all, I'm doing my analysis right on the chart is how long do I have? I mean, what is my expectation for this trade? Am I expecting it to, to run quick? Is it going to take some time? And if it's not, then you basically have to look at it and say, okay, based on my analysis, based on my trading plan, how much time do I need for the plan to, to the trade to work out? So how much time should I buy? That's generically speaking, that's what it is. You do your analysis, you create your trading plan. Okay, which option am I going to buy based on my trading plan? Does that make sense? So let me drop this. I don't know if you can do this or not, but. I don't know if everybody gets this or not, but if you can forward that on, Charlene, that's the, so um, yeah, we're right at four minutes to 10. So I have got to, uh, we've got to wrap up for today. Uh, I'm going on Ben Zinga. If she, I don't know if she can repost that. I don't know if y'all saw that link or not, but that's the YouTube link to uh, Ben Zinga. Okay. If you, if you don't mind dropping that in there. And then if y'all want to join me in patterns of the flash today um, and actually Charlene, uh, Clarice, sorry, Charlene. Um, drop in the patterns of flash link too at two o'clock Eastern time. We're doing my class for um, those that subscribe to patterns in a flash. If you have a subscription, then you have access to that. We'll do a one hour class here at two o'clock Eastern. So um, go do the trial, come join me in the class. And if you want to keep it great. So, all right, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate y'all coming and hanging out. And uh, we will all see you on the next, hopefully we'll see you at two o'clock. Come join me at two o'clock and we'll spend another hour doing, looking at more charts. So, all righty.
Y'all take care. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.